Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, I sit on the risk committee of Goldman Sachs International. It's a very complicated subject, and I thought the clarity that you had was terrific. But I have to say, from a British perspective, uh, one, I'm glad I'm not a general in the Swiss Army, otherwise we wouldn't have had what you said. But secondly, I love the idea of the Swiss chairing European institutions. I, I'm sure that is the best news you could ever have given us this morning. Uh, can I also say how very much I agree with you. Uh, clearly, before the financial crisis, the banking system was under-regulated. About that, there's no problem. On capital and liquidity. My fear at present is that we're in danger of overkill, and then we create an unregulated financial system and the argument is, well, then if people take risks and losses, they will go out of business. I just wonder if that world will really ever come about or whether politicians won't ultimately feel they have to intervene. I'm only sorry you couldn't tell us all the rest of the good news, but thank you very much indeed. It's now time to go on to the uh, first uh, panel uh, discussion in which there'll be Q&A policy making under extreme circumstances. And it's my pleasure to introduce Wolfgang Munsch. Uh, Wolfgang Munsch is a professional journalist. All his life, he's been with newspapers, Times, Financial Times, started the Financial Times of Deutschland. I've been reading newspapers ever since I was a boy growing up in Wales. And the one thing I discovered over all these years is that there are journalists and journalists. <laughs> and there are some journalists, whether you like them or hate them, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, you have to read them. And I have to tell you, Wolfgang Munchau, to me, is one of those journalists. He writes with remarkable clarity, but he always has a compelling argument, as I said, whether you agree or not agree with it. So Wolfgang, it's a great pleasure to have you, and I'd like to invite you and members of the panel to come up here, if you would. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wolfgang, you are a star. I, I, I normally disagree with you. Brian <laughs> Griffiths. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome to our podium discussion on policy making under extreme uncertainty. And Lord Griffith, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, you said later to me that you disagree with me most of the times. Um, <laughs> I have to say to you that sometimes I too disagree with myself. So <laughs> that happens if you have to say something every week. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have probably the ideal, the ideal panel to discuss the, uh, to discuss the subject of policy making under extreme circumstances. If I think of the title, the first politician I could remember of would be the, the position of the Greek Prime Minister. And I'm very, very honored to have uh, George Papandreou here, the former Prime Minister of Greece, uh, as, as, our, as, 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 as one of our panelists. We also have Trevor Manuel, uh, who was a finance minister of South Africa for many, many years, and he's now a minister of the presidency and a, the head of the National Planning uh, Commission of, of South, uh, South Africa. And we have Richard Zulik, former uh, speaker of the Slovakian parliament, and uh, who has brought down the government uh, over his opposition to the uh, rescue programs. Uh, and there has, have been elections since, and uh, it would be very interesting to have a, a, a debate. Now, this is not just going to be a debate about Europe. This is, no, this is, this is, this is, this is you know, the, the big risk that we are facing is not just the Eurozone crisis. It is, it is macroeconomic, global macroeconomic stability. And the Eurozone crisis is part of that. It's an important part of that, but it's not the only part of that. And financial stability is part of that overall macroeconomic instability. It's not the only part of it. So we, we, talk, we want to talk about global, the global the global, the global uh, uh, sphere uh, and how the European 
uh, story interlinks with the global, the global imbalances. I would like to ask each of the panelists to make a short introduction, about three to five minutes, uh, and I would like uh, just to make one uh, comment. Mr. Zulik will speak in German, so if you prepare your, uh, your, 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 your ear sets for that. So I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Papandreou. Well, Wolfgang, thank you very much, and um, I only will begin with uh, adding to your comment. Uh, we, uh, in policy making, I think uh, one, one thing we have learned is that we politicians must learn. We are not omniscient. We have to const constantly rethink our decisions and, and, and often even change our, our views when we live through crises like we have gone through. But I'm very happy to be here, and um, I see uh, some uh, many friends, of course, Joe, Joe Ackerman and, and Jean-Claude Trichet. You lived, and we have lived through this crisis together in different phases, and you know what it is. But um, talking to the leaders of tomorrow, I just will go to an older story um, by saying that in, in ancient Greece, when there was a crisis or a difficult decision to make, they had a symposium, like you here now in St. Gallen. <laughs> and in Greek, the symposium actually means, literally, drinking together. <laughs> um, now, the key person in the symposium then maybe you could call the risk manager, or maybe the central banker, was the one who poured the wine. Because he had to be careful that there was no excess. Nobody could get drunk. They would help the spirits get, get higher, but nobody should have get drunk. Um, you see, Aristotle said that everything in measure, that is how we should go in, 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 our, in, our, in our thinking, in our policy thinking, and Excess was not beautiful in ancient Greece. Uh, today, Ulrich Brecht says, talks about risk, and I think when we talk about innovation, the question is, we are creating, we human beings are creating uh, powers, amazing powers. We can solve many problems, but how do we manage these powers? Um, if we don't manage them well, and it's in excess, we call this hubris. Uh, it's, a, it's a blasphemy to the gods uh, in ancient Greece. Uh, and this is a challenge today. Uh, we have uh, a challenge which the ancient Greeks answered by creating a system, and it was called democracy. A collective, a collective will and a collective control of the powers of the state, of the market, of our societies. And when we see in the, uh, in the financial markets, the excesses of the financial markets, we see the lack of transparency and, and democratic oversight. Or maybe in our euro, uh, the excess of the euro with a lack of democratic um, transparency and the excesses that it created. Or in our debt crisis in Greece and the deficit crisis. It was a lack of governance that I inherited from the previous government, which almost doubled the debt uh, of our country and a huge deficit. Uh, or even with our technologies, uh, whether it's nuclear, whether it's uh, the internet and privacy. These are questions which we collectively have to deal with in a democratic way. And I think our younger generation today is, 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 is facing a paradox that we have so much capacity as human beings, but uh, at the same time, and we can solve our problems, poverty, we can solve the question of lack of education, of climate change, of unemployment, but are we using these, are we managing these powers in a, in a, in a democratic and, 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 and an efficient way? And if we don't, I think we will see a backlash both to globalization, a renationalization, but also a backlash to politics and to democratic politics. And we see this in the extremes that we are now seeing, for example, in Europe, uh, extreme parties. Well, my experience was that we had a hubris in Greece when I took over a huge deficit uh, and debt. Uh, and the, the slogan, actually, when I was, became prime minister during the elections was, either Greece changes or we sink. So I knew I had to make very important and difficult decisions to change Greece. And in fact, we have changed, despite the media and the preconceptions. Uh, we brought in, first of all, transparency everywhere. Everything in, uh, in, in government decisions is online now. Uh, we have opened up 150 professions, changed the labor market. 
We have, um, uh, in the medical area, we have cut 30% of the costs of the medicine because we have online prescriptions fighting corruption. Our exports have increased by 37% in 2011. Uh, we have uh, been able to use crowdsourcing, as someone said earlier, for uh, legal issues. We, when we had laws, we put them on the internet to be discussed by the people. Uh, we have chosen top executives, again, through the internet, uh, by open procedures. We have reformed our pension system, our education system, local government, and we have been able in two years to cut GDP deficit by 6.5%. And from a primary deficit of 25 billion, we are now down to 2 billion, and soon we'll have a primary surplus. And Greece has great potential. The young people are showing that they can be amazing innovators in mobile applications. We are doing very well now in, in new forms of agriculture, in tourism, in green energy, uh, in shipping, in aquaculture. These are many, uh, and services, these are many areas where Greece can excel. And despite the uh, prejudices, and I think this is one of the things we have to manage, um, is uh, Greece, I, I, when people were saying Greeks are lazy, they're not working, I looked at the OECD figures and uh, lo and behold, we are number one as far as working hours in the OECD. Uh, and um, when they were saying Greek, Greece is not reforming, we are not doing things, well, the OECD came out with a report a few weeks ago, we are number one in the OECD countries as far as structural reforms uh, are concerned. But this is one of the problems, and I want to conclude with this. Um, markets, media, uh, we're not trusting. We're not trusting what we were trying to do, what we were doing in, 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 in our politics, in, 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 in the movement ahead. They wanted things much more quickly, and they were also worried about what was uh, the Euro's construction. So I knew from the beginning, or quite early on, that this was not just a Greek problem, that we had to collectively deal with his mistrust, the risk factor, the, the fears that the market had. And this is where Europe is essential. We did, many said, too little too late, but in fact we did much more than Europe has ever done in such a short period in creating a mechanism of rescue um, and, of course, in dealing with this crisis. Of course, it shows the volatility of policymaking today. I remember, and Jean-Claude will remember very well, when the program for Greece was decided and the mechanism also for other countries in the future, in the end, Portugal and Ireland, uh, we weren't sure then uh, which countries might be part of this mechanism. This was on a Sunday. We were 27 leaders. Jean-Claude was there also. Uh, and um, we were deciding on uh, the mechanism. And at some point, 2 o'clock in the morning, somebody said, we must finish. We must take decisions immediately. We have no more time. And somebody said, why? Two o'clock in the morning. Why don't we have more time? Because now the markets are opening up in Tokyo. That just shows you the type of difficulties in policymaking we have today. Uh, this, the volatility, the interdependence, uh, the strength of the markets, and I would say the need for intervention uh, and, and, and some regulation. Now, I heard a lot about uh, liberal markets and so on. I think, again, here we have to be careful of hubris. When we make the market a god, we are, we are this is blasphemy, I think, to the gods also. Um, and I will go back to Greece and say, uh, we have a word. If you look from the Acropolis down, there is a place called the Agora. The Agora is the marketplace. Now, agora in Greek also means, not only marketplace, it means a public speech, it means politics, it means democracy. So, democracy and the market were not separated then. Policies and the markets were linked. And this is what we somehow separated these two and created some entities, some silos, and some, we made them statues and gods. I don't believe that either the state or the market should be a god. Uh, they have to serve our people, and that is what democracy means. I just want to add with this that uh, we talk about Europe, 
And of course, the, 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 the markets, uh, we were slow in reacting to this major pressure of the markets, and that meant that instead of just change in Greece and reform, we also had to take very deep austerity measures, uh, very quickly. And that is painful. And, uh, but I was, and the pain is felt now in Greece, and some of this pain is very unjust to people who did not have responsibility for this crisis. But at the same time, the deeper pain is not just the cut in pensions and wages. It is the constant uncertainty we have lived through over the past year, year and a half. Will Greece default? Will Greece leave the euro? Uh, will there be a catastrophe? Will the Cassandras come true? That is more difficult. So I think when we talk about risk management, we also have to see, and innovation, we have to see how much can our institutions accept? How much pressure can they accept? Some pressure can be constructive and can be beneficial. Much more becomes a punishment. And this is, I think, where we need our collective will. This is where Europe has great potential. Europe showed it has great potential, even though we may not have solved our problems and we still have much to do, as you Wolfgang very well have written in many articles. But I believe if we go back to basics in Europe, as someone has said, prosperity, solidarity, democracy, transparency, not trying to scapegoat that Greeks are bad, the Germans are bad, those are bad, and these. We have to work together uh, and as a collective. This is what Europe is. This is what Europe was, and that's how it began. And that is what Europe must be in the future. And uh, the more we integrate, the more we work collectively, the more we will be able to be optimistic. And I am optimistic for Europe and for Greece. Thank you. Yes. Minister, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much for the, uh, this very encouraging opening uh, statement. I, I will ask questions, but I will do it after the, the in initial introductions. I would like now to turn to uh, Richard Zulik uh, for his opening remarks. Vielen Dank. Ich hoffe, Sie werden mir verzeihen, dass ich die Möglichkeit nutze, in uh, Deutsch zu sprechen. Gehen mir auch die Jokes etwas besser. <coughs> Ja, wir haben jetzt gehört über die Erfolge von Griechenland und äh, eine Verteidigung des Herrn Papandreou. Und ich will das ja auch nicht anzweifeln, nur es ist halt sehr schwierig, aus der Sicht eines Slowaken nachvollziehen, warum wir solidarisch sein sollen mit einem Volk, das zweifache Gehälter, dreifache Renten hat. Und abgesehen davon, warum überhaupt? Ich verstehe schon, dass äh, die gemeinsame Währung der Euro uns aneinander gekettet hat. Aber es gibt auch bestimmte Regeln. Und wir sprechen heute über die Risiken und vielleicht bevor man, bevor man sich zu viel Gedanken macht, wie man, wie man die Risiken managt, sollte man sich Gedanken darüber machen, wie man, wie man das Risiko im Vorhinein minimieren kann. Zum Beispiel durch Einhaltung der Regeln oder zum Beispiel dadurch, dass man nur solche Sachen macht, die man dann auch wirklich beherrscht. Wir haben eine gemeinsame Währung. Ich denke, für die Slowakei war das, ein, war das eine gute Möglichkeit, der Eurozone beizutreten. Allerdings nur bei Einhalten, Einhalten der Regeln. Zum Beispiel, dass jedes Land für seine Schulden selbst haftet. Ich bin davon überzeugt, der Euro und jetzt die, die ganze Rettung von Griechenland am meisten Griechenland selbst schadet. Wir sind heute in einer Situation, wo Tomaten nach Griechenland importiert werden, aus Holland. Und das ist eine Situation, die nicht für lange Zeit gut gehen kann. Und ich denke, aus heutiger Sicht hat Griechenland keine andere Chance, als aus der Eurozone herauszutreten. Ich verstehe selbst nicht, warum die führenden Politiker in Brüssel, warum die so stark daran sich halten. Vielleicht Machen die das deswegen, weil die das ja schon immer behauptet haben und ein Politiker darf ja nicht einfach so seine Meinung wechseln. Aber aus rein ökonomischer Sicht wäre es schon viel besser, wenn Griechenland einen wirklichen Neuanfang machen könnte. Wenn es vor zwei Jahren passieren würde, hätten die Griechen schon das Schlimmste überstanden und auch die Slowakei müsste nicht zahlen. Uns ist es gelungen, das erste Darlehen nach Griechenland 
wobei jeder gewusst hat, dass es sich um kein Darlehen handelt, sondern um ein, um ein Geschenk. Äh, es ist uns gelungen, das abzulehnen in, im slowakischen Parlament. Leider, dass als das zweite Darlehen kam, wo noch mehr Leute gewusst haben, dass es kein Darlehen ist, sondern nur ein Geschenk. Ja, da sind wir leider diesen, haben wir uns gefügt, diesem kollektiven Unfug und haben jetzt äh, dem zugestimmt. Griechenland hat Unmengen von Geld verbraucht und trotzdem ist es nicht wettbewerbsfähig und wird es auch nicht sein. Und äh, ich will schon glauben, über die Erfolge, äh, wenn der Herr Papandreou über die Erfolge berichtet, trotzdem ein ganzes Land wettbewerbsfähig zu machen und gleichzeitig die Austerity-Programms äh, zu realisieren innerhalb von vielleicht zwei Jahren, ist, wie wir sehen, unmöglich. Deswegen, deswegen wäre es vielleicht besser, mal jetzt wirklich darüber nachzudenken, welche anderen Möglichkeiten wir noch haben und nicht mit den Stimmklappen an den Augen sich zu sagen, okay, wir müssen, die, wir müssen den Euro und die Eurozone und Griechenland da drin um jeden Preis retten, weil so wie die Entwicklung aussieht, kann es sein, dass der Brocken zu groß sein wird. Ich wollte in meiner Einführungsrede auch etwas über die Demokratie sagen, aber ich bin mir auch der Zeitgrenzen bewusst und will das jetzt nicht übertreiben, dann vielleicht etwas später in den Fragen. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Good morning to all of you. The temptation to enter a debate uh, that I know nothing about, uh, if Walter is non-European, then uh, I should be excluded on the basis of being an African. But I, I think we've got to take a, a slightly broader pan than European, European sort of issues. Uh, in, in my experience, two, two issues. Clearly, our political transition in South Africa is, is fraught with risk and, and the lessons Uh, of, of how to manage in a contending situation, I think is part of what history would reflect on managing decisions and, and the role of, of certainly our first president in democracy, Nelson Mandela, uh, has been quite astounding in that. But the other is just the global economy. I mean, I, along with people like Jean-Claude, were there in the G20 from before it was the G20 when it was... Uh, initially the Willard Group. And over the period, I think, we, we were alive to some of the challenges. Um, now, one of the contradictions that arose was, uh, on the one hand, the, the Chinese have uh, a word for establishing truth from facts. And I think it's fundamentally important in, in risk appreciation, truth from facts. Uh, I'll get the pronunciation wrong. I'll risk it, though. Xi Xi, Xiu Xi, truth from facts. Um, you see, I got it wrong, that was what the laughter was about. <laughs> um, but as we discussed uh, the trends that were taking place in the global macroeconomy, because I think much of what we're seeing within countries is a, is a subset of a, of a larger problem. Much of what we've seen is a consequence of refusing to establish the truth from facts that were presenting themselves. And it was impossible in communiques of either the G20 or the IMFC to get the words global and imbalances used in the same sentence successively. And so nobody wanted the truth from the facts. Uh, and so it was something we all danced around. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that, that if we had brought the issues into the open, spotlighted them, and developed uh, a range of, 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 of futuristic perspectives on them, uh, the outcomes would have been very different for banks, for countries, uh, for the management of risk across, uh, across the global economy. Uh, I think that, that the, the, there are a series of issues that, that my little experience would bring to the fore. The first is then... Uh, uh, ensuring that we, we, we can bring information to, to the fore, how much of it. Uh, uh, secondly, who is told when, and the issue of communication is fundamentally important. I mean, if we look back on any of the experiences, if we knew 
how big the hole uh, in, in, in the FISC was, and we told people and, and took them into trust, would the outcomes have been different at, at any given point? The third issue is how we prepare the ground, because sometimes these shocks uh, create schisms uh, 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 in society, and I think that, that part of managing it, and I, I, if, I, if I just take a little peek at, at the Greek experience, it started in an election, it started between one party and the other, but ultimately you can't com compartmentalize either the problem or the solution to party political solutions. You need, you need national solutions. And so ensuring that there's collective responsibility, even by those who have not been party to the decision but would be in continuity part of the solution, uh, uh, becomes fundamentally important. Uh, and then the issue of how we deal with, uh, uh, with resistance. And frequently the resistance comes through in ideology, and ideology comes from both sides of the spectrum. It comes through from ignorance and the absence of just information is part of that. And thirdly, uh, uh, just inertia. The inability to take decisions even when the facts present themselves uh, as needing to take decisions. And I think that part of what we need to do uh, in, in, in the global polity now is to try and take a view of those issues and then evaluate and, and decide where the best decisions uh, are going to be. One can look at uh, more recently, um, you know, I can go back to the G20 meeting in Melbourne, probably in 2005. It was agreed that the heads of the IMF and the World Bank should be appointed on merit from an open system. It's been contained in every statement of the G20. Certainly when the heads of state first met in Pittsburgh, it was there. But these issues are resisted, and they're resisted and held back by local politics. And so the question of leadership in the context of risk is whether we can rise above the immediacy of the next election and take a longer view. Uh, and this, I think, is, is part of what I do in, a, in my, my, day, my day job. We're taking a view on 2030. We're looking past five election cycles to get there. But it's very important because uh, it is informative of the nature of the challenge. So let me stop there and we can have a discussion. Thanks. Trevor, thank you very much. On the subject of risk, we have learned in the global financial crisis that we cannot, and as the film also told us, we cannot measure it. Uh, precisely, certainly, we cannot reduce it to a number. Uh, the best we can do is understand aspects of it and try to manage it. Uh, in both the Eurozone and the global economy, uh, we have institutions to manage the risk, but these institutions have been strained, to put the least, because most of the risk that we've encountered was network risk, risk that was not just related to a single country, but in the relation between countries and our institutions had to be, in, in the Eurozone, had to be adapted and rebuilt. And uh, there is a debate here in Europe now about whether these institutions should be transformed even further. Um, Jean-Claude Trichet talked about uh, a European Treasury Secretary, others have talked about a, a Eurobond, a, a fiscal union, a banking union. These are discussions that we are, we are, we are, we are holding. A similar discussion is at the, global, at the global level. Are the global institutions that we created for the Bretton Woods system uh, 60 years ago, are those institutions still right, uh, the, best, the best institutions or the best setup to manage a, 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 a global economic system that is uh, not just interwoven, but so interdependent that, that, that risks in one part uh, have very severe consequences of risks in the other part. So could I ask you about thinking about the, the architecture, about, about, about risk management? What, you know, is, is it sufficient what we have? What, in your view, needs to be done? And you know, how, dem how, how, how democratic is this if we basically try to manage the Eurozone from a, a fiscal center or the world economy from you know, a, an institutionalized equivalent of the G20 or G40 or whatever it's going to be. Prime Minister. Well, that's a very difficult, very important question, but a very difficult question. I, I, uh, I will begin by saying, making a, a, um, a general statement about Europe. Uh, Europe began as a peace project after the Second World War. 
uh, and it still is a peace project. We are integrating, when you talk about enlargement, it's basically bringing a wider number of countries into a family of values. Peace, uh, prosperity, solidarity, open markets, democracy, and so on. But it also, I believe today, is the challenge for Europe and the experiment that Europe is, is an answer to a globalizing economy. Uh, how do we work together, sovereign nations, with our sovereign um, uh, institutions and dem democracies, work together to deal with wider challenges that are beyond our borders? It could be climate change, it could be the financial crisis, it could be unemployment, it could be poverty, it could be uh, migration, it could be any of these many issues. And uh, this, is, this is the challenge for Europe. Uh, I believe in further integration. I believe we need, I, I, we can get into what types of integration, whether it's the central banks and the banking, more unified banking system, more economic governance, uh, more uh, harmonization of tax policies, uh, social policies, uh, and so on. Uh, I believe, uh, however, that there will be a question of what, uh, what does that mean for our democratic institutions? Uh, at the global level, it would be even more difficult when you ask that question. At the European level, there are some ideas that have come up, and I have been a proponent of one of them, of some of them. For example, we are now talking of a possibility of a referendum European-wide, or uh, electing a, a head of the, of the European Union, as, uh, let's say, uh, you could have direct elections with some proportion or some electorates, uh, depending on the... Uh, to give some more votes for, let's say, smaller countries. Um, you, we need to democratize the integrated Europe in that, in that sense. But at the same time, I would, I would add that um, Europe is, is also facing, and um, because my friend um, Mr. Zolik was saying about the uh, uh, agriculture in Greece, I don't think it's so much the Eurozone that created an, uh, an inefficient, uh, non-competitive agriculture. It was some of the bad CAP, you know, common agricultural policies, that did not help. Uh, we, were, we, were, uh, we were giving subsidies to, to, to develop uh, agricultural uh, products, which then we threw away. They didn't have to be competitive. So we ended up creating uh, an agriculture which was very dependent on subsidies rather than becoming more uh, competitive. We have to change this. Uh, and, but this is not just a Greek problem. Competitiveness of the developed world is a big issue. And it's not just the European, it's the US uh, is, is, is losing jobs to, to Asia or to other parts of the world, to the emerging markets. And I think this is where we have to work together to see what is the model of growth. It's not just growth, but it has to be a kind of growth which is competitive and sustainable and green. So I think these are the major challenges we have. So, I can Ihnen auch dieselbe Frage stellen. Ich möchte Ihnen noch aber eine, einen kleinen Zusatz machen. Sie haben ja erklärt, warum Sie gegen Transfers sind, mit, aus Gründen der, 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 der Einkommensungleichheit, was ja auch völlig politisch nachvollziehbar ist. Die Frage ist, wären Sie auch äh, gegen eine, eine, eine Lösung, die jetzt nicht auf zwischenstaatlichen Transfers beruht, sondern, mal, sagen wir mal in einer, sondern auf, einer, auf einer föderalen Lösung, wo die, wo die Transfers nicht zwischen Nationen passieren, sondern zwischen, zwischen Reichen und Armen? Steuerzahlern. Wenn man die Transfers einfach nicht so sieht, ja. <lacht> Nun ja, ich bin ja nicht grundsätzlich gegen mehr Europa, auch gegen ein eine föderales System. Nur, ich sage, man muss die Leute fragen. Das hängt auch zusammen mit Ihrer vorherigen Frage, wie demokratisch sind die zentralen Institutionen. Also ich als Slowake habe die Möglichkeit, den slowakischen Premierminister abzuwählen, und eine sehr kleine, begrenzte Möglichkeit habe ich, den slowakischen Kommissar in, in, in Brüssel abzu die Möglichkeit, ihn abzuwählen. Ich habe keine Möglichkeit, einen Herrn Barroso abzuwählen. Und schon gar, kein, schon gar keine Möglichkeit habe ich, die Leute abzuwählen, die wirklich über das Schicksal auch der Slowaken entscheiden, zum Beispiel Frau Merkel und Herrn Sarkozy. Und ja, jetzt, wie weiter... Und natürlich gefällt mir das nicht. Und mir gefällt auch nicht, dass im Grunde die meisten Entscheidungen dort gefallen werden, dass da vielleicht 10, 20 Leute unter sich das irgendwie aushandeln. Und wenn Sie mich aus dieser Sicht der Dinge fragen, ob ich für mehr föderales Europa wäre und mir dann vorstelle, dass über Hunderte von Milliarden Euro irgendwo entschieden wird, 
nicht demokratisch, äh, dann, ja, das ist eine dann sehr schwierige Frage, weil natürlich möchte ich als guter Europa gelten, weil wenn man sich dazu kritisch äußert, dann ist man gleich in so eine extreme Ecke gedrückt und da muss man natürlich dann aufpassen. Ich möchte noch kurz auf Herrn Papandreou reagieren. Er sagte über die, die Subventionen in der Landwirtschaft. Ja, das ist auch ein Übel von Europa, weil das Ergebnis ist, dass dann die Tomaten aus Holland nach Griechenland importiert werden. Wenn es die nämlich nicht gäbe, wäre Griechenland mehr wettbewerbsfähig, eben in der Landwirtschaft. Und äh, ich kenne jetzt nicht genau die Verhältnisse in Griechenland, aber zum Beispiel in der Slowakei wurde in den letzten 15 Jahren die Landwirtschaft systematisch liquidiert. Wir haben vielleicht ein Drittel von den ursprünglichen Beständen und auch vielleicht ein Drittel oder Viertel der Leute arbeitet in der Landwirtschaft. Und ja, es ist dann sehr schwer, auf die Frage positiv zu antworten, ob wir für mehr ein föderales Europa sind, es wäre dann schon besser, wenn die einzelnen Völker über, über zum Beispiel deren Wirtschaften entscheiden. Aber wie ich anfangs gesagt habe, auf jeden Fall müssen es die Leute selbst entscheiden. Wir haben 2004 ein Referendum gemacht in der Slowakei. Die Mehrheit der Bevölkerung war für einen Eintritt in die, in, in die Europäische Union. Wenn wir jetzt ein föderales Europa haben möchten, müssen wir wieder die Leute fragen. Ich weiß natürlich, dass die Politiker in Brüssel das nicht tun werden, weil die Angst haben. Ich erinnere mich, Herr Papandreou ist auf diesen komischen Gedanken gekommen, ein Referendum zu machen und ja, drei Tage später war der nicht mehr Premierminister. Ich habe mir dann auch irgendwie äh, erlaubt, zu laut zu sagen, das, was aus Brüssel kommt, ist nicht immer richtig und ja, drei Tage später war ich nicht mehr der Parlamentspräsident und damit, damit muss man leben, das ist okay. Nur sollen dann die Leute in Brüssel, die manchmal habe ich den Eindruck, dass die unter einer Glaskuppel leben, sollen die dann nicht denken, dass die Bevölkerung wirklich ein föderales Europa will. Okay. Trevor, um, the head of the IMF is uh, French again. Uh, the head of the World Bank is going to be American again. Um, is this going to work? You know, um, apropos the head of the World Bank, uh, at least there was a semblance of interviews. It was the first time. Um, I happen to be of the view that uh, Ngozi is an exceedingly competent uh, person and uh, was an exceedingly good candidate. Um, but I think that the issues are not premised on individual competence. It's premised on nationality. Uh, I mean, listening to the debate, uh, the European debate, uh, 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 why do countries remain in Europe, including uh, yours? Uh, but let's not go there. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, there, there are a different set of issues. The, the, the key question I think we need to try and get our heads around is what you were raising earlier. The institutions are more than 60 years old. Um, there have been some adjunct institutions developed along the line. The FSB would be one of those. Uh, uh, and, and amongst the questions that, that must confront us now is whether the misalignment doesn't propose a bigger risk going forward. Because I think Basel III, very important in dealing with the last crisis, but we actually need to get our heads around the next crisis. Um, and, and the risk is that you might actually tie up capital uh, in, in a way that doesn't facilitate the growth that the global economy needs. And this happens in a misalignment in where you don't have adequate accountability. Uh, just to, to spark a bit of discussion and debate, uh, not a European, clearly I'm not. Also, we, we aren't members of NATO. I was a bit concerned about whether NATO should have been used in the way that NATO forces were in Libya last year. You see, once you have an instrument that is not fully accountable and you use it in good times, what happens in bad times? Because I don't think the, the force was designed uh, 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 exclusively for, for uh, a decision, however, Uh, 1973 was structured in the Security Council. I think that once you make these kinds of mistakes, it's better 
to own up that this was an error and not to repeat them. Because if you misuse instruments, uh, it's very, very hard to come uh, back because as, as uh, Prime Minister Papandreou was saying that part of the difficulty is, is to appreciate what the institutions mean now, what misalignment and disconnect means, and what the risk of failed accountability is uh, in the current milieu. Thanks. So I'm going to just nail you on the question of do you think that we need new institutions or do we build on existing ones and how do you deal with the issue of <clears throat> democracy? In the, in, the, in the EU we have created a democratic structure with the European Parliament. But there is a, a degree of democratic accountability if not to the extent that Robert, uh, Rich, uh, Richard Zulik wants it to be. But um, you know, we don't have anything at all at the, at the global level. We don't have anything at the global level. What you probably uh, are likely to have um, is, is some arrangement by, by regional blocs rather than inde independent sovereign states. Um, you know, we now have uh, 54 African countries. Uh, there's a virtual war between uh, Sudan and, and South Sudan. Uh, there, there's an ongoing war within a traditional Sudan, uh, in, in some of the provinces, and uh, Darfur uh, and Nubia would be, would be a case in point. Um, you can't have further balkanization and hope that by increasing the number of sovereign states, you've resolved the problem. You can't. We need to reconstruct the way in which regions function. I think it's the only way out uh, so that we can have uh, uh, arrangements, and I think that, that uh, on that basis, uh, ensuring that, that Europe can be maximally democratized, I think would be a signal uh, for the rest of, of, of the world, certainly. I think that, that Africa would benefit from that experience. Right. So essentially a move towards, loosely speaking, a G4, where Africa, Americas, Europe, Asia, together coordinate rather than at the, at, the, at the fragmented level of individual member states. Yeah, and, but, but, you know, Asia may, 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 may not may sit comfortably. You, you might have to split China That's and right. India, right. uh, however. But, 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 yes. are, but, but you mean regional Broadly, blocks that make yes. sense in, in, yeah. in some in geopolitical, uh, geoeconomic context. We still have 10 minutes because ours is the session that actually did get truncated. Um, so we, we have, we have uh, actually about well, even less than 10 minutes, so I, have, I would like to turn this over to the audience. Were we truncated because of Captain Walter? <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to turn this over to the audience. I can't see many of you because of the lights, but if you can hold up your hand and um, ask a question to the, to the panel. There is a question, I think, over there. Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ahad. Uh, I'm from Pakistan and study in Singapore. Um, my question is directed to the panel, and it's regarding leadership in international institutions, because I feel that the leadership is heavily from Western uh, nations, and like you said, that we need some sort of representation that uh, shows that emerging markets like China, India, uh, Brazil are being represented. Because it, the European problem is not just European problem, it does affect us all because we live in a globalized world. So what exactly is being done in specific terms? What is being done to provide countries that have uh, you know, emerging economies to have a say in the European issues? Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone like to take that one on? It's a good question. <laughs> the, the question is whether the emerging markets have a, a, a say in the European issues? Or and, how to, and how to ensure that, that, their, that their influence is heard or that their voices are heard in Europe but also in the global, in the global framework? Well, I think what you were saying, if I could, if I could was, is, is right that we, we should go to a, and there have been proposals in, around the UN and I know there's also after the financial crisis, Joe Stiglitz was chairing a committee of the, in, uh, in the UN about financial uh, regulation worldwide and, and the idea of representing regions but this also means that regions themselves will have to work together uh, is I think a 
something in the future where they will have much more of a voice, and not only the emerging markets, but every region. And uh, this is why, in a sense, Europe is important as an experiment, because uh, if we can work together, if we can show that regions can work together in a democratic way, uh, then I think we can show that there is a way for global democratic governance through the regions. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with what Mr. Zolik was saying about democracy in Europe, but the question is, in Europe, I just want to get back to this for one minute, is, are we becoming, going to become more democratic simply by renationalizing uh, and go back to our, our, our countries? Because this is one, one option. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I, I, I believe in, in our democracies at the, at, the, at the national level, and that's why I asked for a referendum, and of course there was much reaction to this uh, in some parts of Europe. Uh, it ended up in becoming a, creating a, a, a coalition government, which was positive in, in, in the end. But uh, I believe we need more integration and more democracy, not more concentration of power in the bureaucracy, but more integration and more democratic institutions. Because yes, we do have uh, some semblance of, of, of supranational institutions in Europe, but still they have a very strong national basis. Even the commissions, the commissioners, are elected from the country. The, the deputies are, are, are from the country. Of course, the council is representatives of the countries. So we need to look at our democracy in Europe as, in, in a different way. Uh, but I just want to add one thing with, with Europe, because I think it's very important. Uh, we are at a point where Europe is at a, at a crossroads. I do believe that the euro is very important. We need to keep the euro alive, and it can be alive, and I think the Europeans in general uh, are in favor of keeping the Euro European alive, both at the population level but also at the <coughs> leadership level. But it's important for a, a number of other reasons. I, I, use it, I said it's an example for a globalizing society, but it's also very important geopolitically. Think of the Arab Spring, for example. What is Europe emulating as, as, as a model? Is it a model that uh, uh, new young Arab leaders would like to follow? Uh, uh, what happens if we have uh, a breakdown in, in Europe of huge unemployment? Uh, how much this will affect, affect uh, from Russia to, to, to southern Mediterranean to Africa? Uh, Europe is uh, a stabilizing force and also a possible vision, I think, that we need to keep alive. If, uh, if I may, just, just, just try and come back to the question. I think, I think one of the questions that, that we have to try and focus our minds on in the context of leadership is what values drive decision making and what values, what, which of those values will leaders never give up at, at, at any cost. And we, we have a wonderful experience in South Africa of a very successful negotiated transition. We just celebrated uh, the 18th birthday of our democracy on Friday last week. And we have a constitution that was negotiated that can stand up to any just on the strength of convictions in that constitution. So it's possible. I think if there's a message from South Africa is that it's possible. Now, if one turns us to, to, to the question about European issues, perhaps the place where this comes to the fore most strongly is in the WTO negotiations. Because the point that Prime Minister Papandreou raises, the point about Dutch tomatoes in Greece, is that countries are not prepared to give up. You can, you can sit down with leaders, look at the numbers, look at the, the absence of ethics in the common agricultural policy. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of convincing, but when countries get together, they opt to retain the common agricultural policy. Just like the United States wants to retain the farm bills and, and fund inefficient agriculture. So at a world level, you talk about market access and there's, there's broad agreement with the principle. But nobody wants to give up what is fundamentally wrong and in the interests of a select few in the world, which is why the inefficiencies are actually exponentially increased and retained. And perhaps the definition of an optimist in the world is Pascal Lamy. Pascal believes that the Doha round will be delivered. Uh, somebody's got to believe it, but we need an agreement on world trade. Without that, I think that uh, uh, the inefficiencies and inequalities will remain manifest. Thanks. Ich möchte kurz noch auf Herrn Papandreou reagieren. 
Natürlich ist es jetzt nicht die einzige Lösung oder nicht einmal eine reelle Lösung, zu den einzelnen Nationen zurückzukehren, also dieses Renationalizing. Nein. Aber ich sage, man muss die Leute fragen und solange man das nicht tut, dann sollte man sich nicht zu schnell mit, den, mit dem föderalen Staat beeilen. Ein, ein sehr wichtiges Merkmal ist äh, zum Beispiel die Tatsache, warum sich kein Spitzenpolitiker, kein europäischer Spitzenpolitiker um, um europäische Spitzenämter nicht äh, bewirbt. Warum zum Beispiel die Frau Merkel oder der Herr Sarkozy, warum die nicht äh, der Chef der Kommission werden möchten. Da, da tun sie jemanden hin, wo, wo irgendwie alle einig sind, dass das die beste Lösung ist, aber die Leute bewerben sich, die wirklich mächtigen Leute in Europa, bewerben sich nicht direkt um die wichtigsten Posten. Das ist für mich ein Indikator darum, äh, dafür, dass vielleicht Europa, Europa hier zu schnell voranschreitet, dass die Leute irgendwie dann entfremdet, sich dem Gedanken entfremden. Wenn wir uns 60, 70 Jahre zurückschauen, sehen wir das, oder werden wir feststellen, Europa ist auf vier Ideen entstanden, der freie Verkehr von Kapital, von Waren, von Dienstleistungen und von Personen. Aber wir haben uns von diesen Idealen, die, die man unter dem Begriff mehr Freiheit äh, zusammenfassen kann, wir haben uns richtig entfernt. Wir, wir haben jetzt eine Regulierungswut, wir haben 100.000 Seiten von Richtlinien, wir haben 60.000 Beamte in Brüssel. Ich weiß nicht, ob man 60.000 Beamte in Brüssel braucht dafür, dass ein Grieche oder ein Slowake mehr Freiheit hat, aber ich weiß ganz genau, dass äh, wenn eine Anordnung kommt, die sagt, ich darf mir keine Wolframbirne, Glühbirne kaufen, ich darf mir keinen Staubsauger mit einer Leistung über 1000 Watt kaufen, dann frage ich, ob das jetzt wirklich mehr Freiheit ist. Und ja, dann muss auch die Frage erlaubt sein, ob wir, ob wir jetzt äh, dogmatisch daran festhalten müssen, mehr Europa ist gut für alle. Wir haben Zeit für noch eine Frage und wir haben fünf Wortmeldungen. Die erste Wortmeldung war da hinten, die ich gesehen habe. Dort der Herr, der jetzt immer noch seine Hand hoch. Ja, genau, dort. Um, thank you very much. I'm from Azerbaijan, Center for Economic and Social Development. Um, I'm specializing in European Affairs. Um, My question is related with European public deliberation space as a solution for uh, Europe's inherent problems. Uh, we're here today um, talking about risk, facing risk. And one of the hot topics has been that EU's inherent risk aversion has been um, avoiding to provide sufficient European public deliberation space. Um, this is the first. Uh, my, my question is that, to what extent the European public deliberation space enhancement would be a sort of solution for uh, the problems such as European crisis? And the second question is that, to what, to what extent EU fiscal union would be a solution for democratic deficit within the EU? Thanks. Thank you. I'm not quite sure what you mean by public del deliberation space. Is there something specific you, you mean or is there a... Yeah. Uh, public <coughs> deliberation space in academia and also in the practical world means that uh, si mere ordinary citizens of, of the European Union who are affected by the decisions of the bureaucrats of Brussels have um, sufficient access to all the online or offline um, platforms for decision making, for debates, for you know, all the deliberations about the issues that uh, directly affect their lives. For example, uh, Eurozone crisis, how, I mean, they could play the role. Okay, I, just, I just wanted the clarification because we are, we are that, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was okay. We'll give the panel the chance to answer in the, in the, last, in the last five minutes. Any thought, fiscal union, is that the answer? Do we need a, a different organization in, in the way we access information and in the way we, we debate, we debate uh, issues, or is the, I mean, you've been a member of the European Council, uh, this is not a, 
a televised uh, 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 gathering. Uh, is, this, is this right? Is this sort of the fact that you all meet in secret? Is that the right way to make decisions? Well, I wouldn't say we meet in secret, but I would agree with, uh, with Mr. Zulek that the way we make decisions, I am not happy with. Uh, I, I would say that we, we have... Uh, it's, it's, it's obviously very difficult uh, if you think of the global situation, uh, but even at the, at the regional situation, 27 different countries coming together, making decisions, is not, is not an easy uh, task, and particularly when we have a crisis, uh, to make a decision quickly, not to know all the ramifications of the possible decisions. I remember when Jean-Claude Trichet was talking about the, this, the, the proposal of Deauville, and very rightly so, we were not, many of the leaders were not realizing that when you had the, uh, when you created this uh, mechanism that would penalize the private sector for investing in high-risk countries, that this immediately became a self-fulfilling prophecy afterwards, and we had to change that. But the, 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 uh, the destruction, if you like, or the, the, the bad ramifications were there. Um, so we need more deliberation. We need more democratic openness. We need more transparency. And uh, even uh, there's a German philosopher, Jürgen Habermas, has talked about the demos of, of Europe, how we make this. And I, I, I agree very much, this is absolutely necessary. What I am saying is that, that, that um, whether it's the light bulb or whether it's the agricultural CAP or whatever, uh, we need to pull our strengths. We need, this is the potential of Europe, and this is the potential that we need in our, in, in our world to work together. Uh, and we need to find ways to integrate our, our strengths because whether it's climate change or whether it's the financial crisis or whether it's our competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis other countries uh, uh, or whether it's uh, investing in education and fighting unemployment, these are challenges we cannot solve alone. Uh, so therefore we have to work together. The question is, who is going to make the decisions? And that is a democratic question. And I agree very much, we need more democracy in our regional uh, 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 and global societies. And Europe is an experiment where we can find ways to do this. I have to say that in the new uh, uh, Lisbon Treaty, we have some progress. For example, the European Parliament has more of a say. Secondly, we have the capability of people's initiative. That is, they can petition to ask the Commission to uh, deliberate on some issue, uh, if you have one million signatures. But there are other things, as I said, we should think about uh, in, uh, electing uh, someone, and I'm sure that some people like uh, Merkel or, 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 or other leaders would, would want to run for this if we had direct elections in Europe uh, for the leader, or even referenda European-wide. Uh, we need more democracy in Europe, and, and, uh, and uh, I, I, that's, I, I believe that. But at the same time, we also need uh, more integration, uh, and I would agree with very much with, let's say, Francois Hollande now has come up with some ideas, for example, on the euro bonds or on the financial transaction tax and other issues. These are tools uh, which we should look into to deal with uh, the financial crisis and the problems we are facing. So, um, yes, uh, we need more democracy, but at the same time, we need more integration. That's my experience living uh, not only as a European, but also during this crisis as a Greek Prime Minister. Thank you. I, I, I think that we must avoid inertia, and so it's in the nature of the mandating process. I don't think that you're going to have governance in the village, the nation, the region, or the world without trust. And so it's in the nature of the mandating process. This doesn't deflect from the need to have public discussions. It clearly uh, makes a, a larger call on transparency. But you can't have zillions of people taking decisions. It's, it's patently not going to work. Uh, it's about trusting government and, and, and the nature of the mandate. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, we have Papa Andreu said that we need more democracy, so we can only agree. As I said at the beginning, we need more democracy mehr die Einhaltung der Regeln. Wir haben Regeln genug. Ich denke, da, daran mangelt es nicht. Und äh, Sie sagen zwar, Herr Papandreou, äh, ab jetzt gibt es im Lissabonner Vertrag, was im Grunde die Verfassung der EU ist, 
äh, auch schon mehr Rechte für das EU-Parlament, war höchste Zeit. Aber da gibt es auch zum Beispiel einen Artikel 125 und auf einmal gilt er nicht. Da, der, das ist der Artikel, über, das ist die no bail out Klausel und ja, das ist das, wo ich ein sehr, schlechten, sehr schlechtes Gefühl habe, wenn ich sehe, dass die Regeln gelten nur so lange, bis das, bis das, bis das in Ordnung ist, bis, bis das keine Probleme macht. Aber es ist schwierig, die Regeln dann, ein, dann einzuhalten, wenn es, es ist nicht einfach, die Regeln einzuhalten, wenn es eben Probleme macht. Nur ich fürchte, wir gehen immer ein größeres und größeres Risiko ein, eben dadurch, dass wir die Regeln regelmäßig brechen. Zum Beispiel, die ganze Konferenz ist ja Facing Risk äh, gewidmet und natürlich muss zuerst die Frage an der Stelle, zuerst ist ja die Frage angebracht, wie man dem Risiko vorgehen kann. Und wenn ich jetzt sehe, da zum Beispiel, da werden die Sicherheitsstandards abgesenkt für, für die Staatsanleihen, äh, durch die, die die, die äh, äh, Europäische Zentralbank als Sicherheit nimmt, da werden direkt Staatsanleihen einge eingekauft, da werden die Maastricht-Kriterien gebrochen, da wird mit äh, äh, Emergency Liquid äh, Assistance, äh, dieses ELA, hin und her geschachtelt. Da, das, das macht, da geht mir richtig ein Schauern über den Rücken. Wir sagen zwar, okay, wir haben jetzt Regeln, aber wir halten die nur dann ein, wenn es, äh, wenn es eben äh, vorteilhaft ist. Und äh, ja, da fürchte ich, wenn wir in dieser Situation, wo regelmäßig Regeln gebrochen werden, dann sagen, wir brauchen mehr Integration, dass es dann nicht ganz, ganz schlecht endet und wie man im Deutschen sagt, lieber ein äh, Schrecken mit Ende als ein Ende ohne Sch Na, jetzt habe ich das durcheinander gebracht. I don't want to think that I disagree with Mrs. Ulick about the rules. As a matter of fact, if the rules had been applied, I would not have inherited a huge deficit when I became Prime Minister. So I would be in very, a much better situation. Um, so I, I, accountability is necessary. But this is, I think, what we're also talking about now. Uh, part of it is the fiscal pact with much more strict rules as how we, do our, how we manage our economies and much more strict monitoring. Uh, that's not enough. I think we need a growth. We're not talking about growth uh, policies. We need to look at the unemployment issues and so on. But um, I don't disagree with you that we need to, to abide by the rules. We need to change them if they're bad, but we need to abide by them uh, at the same time once, once we institutionalize them. Okay, I think we must, I must conclude now. We are past our, past, past our deadline. I would like to thank the panel. We started off with a discussion on risk. We ended up with a discussion on democracy, and this is no accident. Uh, and that's uh, essentially the, the answer. Uh, or the challenge that we're facing is we, we need to create or adjust the institutions that we have created to deal with those challenges. But also, and this is the really hard part, it's, it's easy to, to solve the crisis uh, of the Eurozone on a piece of paper. I, I do this every week. Uh, <laughs> but it's really hard to actually solve the crisis of the Eurozone uh, in, in a democratic context and to ensure that you have the sufficient support and to ensure that there is representation. And I think that will be the real hard part, and in political terms, probably the biggest, the biggest, the biggest challenge of uh, risk management ahead. Well, I thank the panel, and thank you. <laughs>